and we're going to be returning now to the, the connections of sound with language and music. Music and language are perhaps the primary sound wave patterns that human recognize. The cortex specific to speech is Broca's area and Wernicke's area. So these are two areas of the temporal lobe and part of the frontal lobe that are involved in the perception and processing of language and particular aspects of music. Broca's area is the anterior speech area in the left hemisphere that functions with the motor cortex to produce the movements needed for speaking. We go back right here. Okay, this is the anterior speech area. This is going to be associated with Broca's area, right in here. Things that are moving more anterior to the front. And this functions with the motor cortex, and the motor cortex is in the frontal lobes, and this produces the movements needed for speaking. So what you want to say in your head to how your tongue and mouth need to work together to produce those sounds that convey the particular type of meaning, the particular type of information that you want to convey. Wernicke's area is the speech area at the rear of the temporal lobe that regulates language comprehension. And so this is in a different area of the temporal lobe. It's more right in uh, around here, I believe, but it's in this sort of more rear part of the, uh, of the temporal lobe. And this helps with language comprehension. So if you have damage to Broca's area, then you have trouble producing the sounds that you, that align with what you want to say. If you have trouble, if you have damage to Wernicke's area, then you have trouble understanding what people are trying to tell you, then you might not be able to do so. There's also a cortex that specializes in analyzing music. This is primarily on the right hemisphere. So you have language as a right hand people, language is processed on the left. And so this would be your Broca's area and your Wernicke's area for most individuals would be on the left side. And then music is primarily in the right hemisphere. And it generally corresponds with the same areas of the cortex that are involved in language, but they're primarily on the right side instead of the left side. Okay, so here's, here's Wernicke's area right here. So it's some of the secondary auditory cortex that is surrounding the primary auditory cortex. And then here's Broca's areas right here. So when a word is spoken, okay, that sound is perceived by your ears, and then again, it uh, results in these sound waves that the hair cells bend, they convert this, this into electrical chemical energy that is sent up your nerves, into your thalamus, into the primary auditory cortex, is sent up here into the thalamus, into the primary auditory cortex, and then is sent out to these secondary auditory cortex that contain sort of sound images of words, and then you can determine and comprehend what word was heard. So if you have damage to this area, then you have trouble with comprehension. Now, for producing sound, first you have your thought, then this heads into Wernicke's area, okay? Wernicke's area works with the motor areas here, and there are particular programs that you have for speaking particular words. And so these would be uh, muscle programs, the particular ways that muscles need to move to speak words. So if you have damage to Broca's area, then you're going to have trouble here giving, having a thought that gives rise to particular things that you want to say, and then you need to communicate that stuff that you want to say with the motor cortex, uh, which would result in, again, facial area movement, which would result in activation of your cranial nerves and allow you to speak. So if you have damage to Broca's area, then you cut out this part and it doesn't function as well. And so you can't convert a lot of what you want to say into particular movements that correspond with what you'd like to say. So you have lots of trouble producing, producing language. So Broca's area, in terms of producing language, when you have it, you can have very halted speech. So you can kind of talk like have lot uh, 
intra, you know, and you might not even be able to make out full senses of words. Whereas Wernicke's area, someone, they, they think often that they can talk just fine and they have a high um, sort of fluidity, they can produce it, but then they have trouble understanding what other people say. And because they have trouble understanding what other people say, some of the stuff that they say tends to be more non, tends to be more nonsensical. These are other areas here. So this is Broca's area, again, for discriminating speech sounds. Here's Wernicke's area that tends to travel around here. And then you have the primary auditory cortex. Okay, so this is basic processing of sound information. So the interesting thing about language is that it is universal in human populations. Humans learn language early in life and seemingly without effort. If you think about how much effort you would have to put into learning a new language now, if you, how much effort you have to go into attend um, Chinese, Spanish, Japanese classes, German classes to try to learn this new language. Uh, when you're younger, it appears that you do it without nearly as much effort. And so there's likely a sensitive period for language acquisitions that is basically from about one to six years of age. So it's a larger sensitive period. But if you don't learn language between one and six years of age, then you are not able to speak and communicate as well when you are an adult because you've missed some of that uh, opportunity for a formal organization within your brain. Regardless of which language you are speaking, languages have many structural elements in common. So they all have a syntax and they all have a grammar. And so your brain is tuned to process this particular type of information. One of the conditions that has helped us localize where things are processed in the brain is, is called aphasia. So an aphasia is an, ability, is an inability to speak or comprehend language despite the presence of normal comprehension or intact vocal mechanisms. So basically what that means is that um, if, you have an if you have aphasia, you have an inability to speak or comprehend language despite the fact that you would have ears that function or or intact vocal mechanisms that would enable you to uh, make sounds with your mouth. So Broca's and aphasia um, results to damage to Broca's area, and this results in the inability to speak fluently despite the presence of normal comprehension and an intact ability to make sounds with your mouth. Wernicke's aphasia, on the other hand, is an inability to understand or to produce meaningful language even though the production of words is still intact. So you have trouble understanding what other people are saying to you, even though you can still produce some words. Music processing largely occurs in the right hemisphere. Uh, the left hemisphere plays some role in certain aspects of music processing, such as those involved in making music, recognizing written music, playing musical instruments, and composing but the processing of music that you hear is largely occurs within the right hemisphere. So here on the right side of the brain in terms of localizing music, you have uh, Herschel's gyrus, which would roughly correspond to the primary auditory cortex on the left side of the brain, but this is on the right side of the brain. So you have Herschel's gyrus. So again, listening to bursts of noise. And then when you listen here to melodies, this moves forward and this is the secondary auditory, auditory cortex and then you have the frontal lobe so information moves into the frontal lobes for comparing pitches and then when you compare pitches then that involves an element of recognition because you have to think about what is being said at the moment and comparing it to something that apparently would presumably have been said at a prior time and so then you have a recognition or a recall component. And so the frontal lobes are involved in recalling information and maintaining information uh, for comparison. So when you're comparing pitches or even thinking about aspects of what to say, then this is going to involve regions of the frontal lobe. So like language, the capacity for music may be innate. Infants show learning preferences for musical scales versus random notes and children and adults are very, very sensitive to musical errors. So we are biased towards perceiving regularity in rhythms. 
And so we like, an example of this bias would, we like things that are rhythm, rhythmically oriented. And if you try to take things out of rhythm, then it can feel very jarring and noisy. And it can have that sensation of where it can be this sort of negative jumble that actually can kind of hurt your ears. So that idea that you can have music that not being very loud hurts your ears corresponds with that sort of perception that, oh, this isn't as it should be. This is not, uh, it's not in rhythm. It's out of rhythm. There's something wrong. Uh, so we have a, a bias towards perceiving regularity in our rhythm, in uh, sound rhythms. This comprises the end of chapter 10. And so next we'll be moving on to movement and somatosensory in chapter 11. Make sure that you read chapter 10 so that you can be hearing some of this important content or getting it from other places besides what I'm saying. It will be important to have both what I'm saying in the videos and what you read in the chapters.